Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another lesson. This lesson is on Bud Chiari syndrome. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about what causes this condition. We're also going to talk about some of the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So Bud Chiari syndrome is a liver condition caused by a blockage of hepatic venous outflow. So normally, a lot of blood goes through the liver. It comes through the portal vein, but also through hepatic arteries. These will drain through hepatic veins. And there are actually three main hepatic veins that drain into the inferior vena cava. So Bud Chiari syndrome occurs when there is a blockage of one or more of these hepatic veins. So what will often be noted is that if only one hepatic vein is blocked, this may lead to what we would call a silent Bud Chiari syndrome. There may not be any overt issue from that particular blockage. Oftentimes it may require at least two hepatic veins to be blocked. So we're going to talk a bit more about that in a moment. And it's important to note that the blockage in Bud Chiari syndrome can be either thrombotic or non-thrombotic. So thrombotic meaning that it is from a thrombus or a clot. We're going to talk about many conditions that can increase your risk for clotting and increase your risk for Bud Chiari syndrome in the next slide. Or it can be non-thrombotic. There may be some other process that occludes or leads to the blockage of hepatic venous outflow. So what will happen more specifically is that as mentioned before, there will be blood flow from hepatic arteries. So that will deliver oxygenated blood to the liver. And then there will also be blood from the portal vein from the rest of the gastrointestinal system that will flow into the liver. And then all that blood will mix and flow out of the liver through hepatic veins. So what will happen in Bud Chiari syndrome is that there will be a blockage of one or more of these hepatic veins leading to occlusion or blockage of hepatic venous outflow. You can imagine that if blood cannot get out of the hepatic venous system, there will be hepatic venous congestion. So the hepatic venous system or the hepatic veins themselves will become congested with blood. Blood will not be able to pass the obstruction. Eventually, this will back up into the liver itself, and this will lead to hepatic congestion. So the liver itself will begin to have a backup of blood, and this will lead to some swelling of the liver. And eventually, after this has continued, there will be liver injury. So eventually, hepatocytes or liver cells will become damaged due to this hepatic congestion. And there are some slight differences in how quickly this can occur, and we're going to talk about those later on in this lesson. Now let's get into some of the more specific details as to the causes of Bud Carey syndrome. It's important to note that cases of Bud Carey syndrome may be idiopathic, meaning that there may not be a known cause of the condition. And this can actually be something that can occur in up to 40% of cases. Now, as I mentioned before, a lot of times it's going to be due to clots, so thrombi that get stuck in hepatic veins. So a lot of times hypercoagulable conditions are going to be causes or risk factors for getting Bud Chiari syndrome. So conditions that increase the risk of clotting, for instance, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is one of them, but other ones can include factor V Leiden, protein C deficiency or protein S deficiency. And we can also see it with proxismal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Other conditions like myeloproliferative disorders can also increase the risk and cause Bud Carey syndrome. One of these can include polycythemia vera. Cancers can also increase the risk of Bud Carey syndrome through their ability to increase the risk of clotting, for one, but also the cancer itself may lead to occlusion of the hepatic vein leading to Bud Carey syndrome. So cancer both can increase the risk of clotting and also if there is a cancer in the area of the hepatic vein, that can lead to an occlusion or blockage of the hepatic vein, leading to Bud Carey syndrome. Pregnancy can also be another cause of Bud Carey syndrome. Pregnancy increases the risk of clots as well. We can also see it with oral contraceptive use. So in some individuals, oral contraceptive use can increase the risk of clotting, especially in those that smoke. And if there is an increased blood pressure, this can also increase the risk of clotting from oral contraceptive use as well. Certain chronic inflammatory conditions can also cause Bud Carey syndrome. So the chronic inflammation itself can increase the risk of clots. This can come from conditions like lupus or Bisset disease. 
Chronic infections are another cause of blood carry syndrome. Chronic infections can lead to chronic inflammation themselves and increase the risk of clotting. So chronic infections like tuberculosis or syphilis can be some of these causes. Trauma, so trauma can increase the risk of clotting and also increase the risk of blood carry syndrome. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of blood carry syndrome. So it's important to realize that the course of blood carry and the signs and symptoms are quite variable. So depending on the type of bud carry syndrome or the clinical variant, which we're going to talk about in the next upcoming slides, depending on the clinical variant or the clinical form of bud carry syndrome, it's going to lead to a different course of symptoms. So symptoms can either be very slow, so it can be an indolent course, or it can be quite rapid or sudden. And a lot of the symptoms that we're going to see include hepatomegaly. So hepato referring to the liver, megaly referring to enlargement, so an enlargement of the liver. And along with hepatomegaly, there may also be splenomegaly, so an enlargement of the spleen. Right upper quadrant abdominal pain can also occur. So the right upper quadrant is located here if we were to look directly on a patient. Here is the patient's right side, and this is their right upper quadrant, and that is where the liver is located. So because the liver is becoming congested and inflamed and injured, this can lead to abdominal pain as the liver itself stretches against Glisson's capsule. And there can also be ascites. Ascites would be a swollen abdomen. So if there are issues of blood flow going through the hepatic veins, that fluid will back up into the liver and eventually back up into the abdominal cavity leading to ascites. So hepatomegaly, right upper quadrant abdominal pain, and ascites are actually the classic triad of bud carry syndrome. But again, not necessarily all patients with bud carry syndrome will have these three findings. But again, this is what would be known as a classic triad. Some patients can also have jaundice. So jaundice would be yellowing of the skin in the whites of the eyes. So this would be more specifically known as scleral icterus. And this is due to elevations of bilirubin in the blood, so hyperbilirubinemia. So again, not all cases will have jaundice and not all cases will have all of these symptoms. Some other findings in bud carry include peripheral edema. So there can be, for instance, ankle swelling. So peripheral edema, swelling of the arms and legs, and more specifically, we're going to see it in the lower extremities. So this can all be due to liver injury. The liver itself produces albumin. So this can lead to reductions in albumin in the blood, leading to increased fluid in the interstitial space. And then because of prolonged swelling of the legs, there may be venous stasis ulcers as well. Renal failure can also occur in some patients. And then with liver disease and especially end-stage liver disease like cirrhosis, we can see esophageal varices. So as that blood backs up into other veins, there can be shunting of the blood into esophageal veins causing esophageal varices. So this can lead to issues with esophageal varices. So if you're to look down in someone's esophagus, you can see these varices. And these varices are prone to bleeding. And this can lead to some of its own problems, including increased risk of morbidity, mortality, and blood loss leading to iron deficiency anemia. And then because this can lead to in stage liver disease, bud carry syndrome can also cause a variety of other signs and symptoms of liver disease. If you want more information, please check out my full lesson on the signs and symptoms of liver disease. But the signs and symptoms we talked about in this lesson are going to be the majority of the findings we're going to see in this condition. Now we talked about the fact that there are actually different clinical presentations of bud carry syndrome. And it depends on the clinical type or the clinical form. One of these forms is going to be called acute and subacute. So acute and subacute bud carry syndrome. Another one is going to be considered chronic bud carry syndrome. And another one is going to be fulminant bud carry syndrome. So in acute and subacute bud carry syndrome, we're going to see particular signs and symptoms more frequently. With acute and subacute, we're going to see a rapid onset of signs and symptoms, including right upper quadrant pain, jaundice, ascites, and renal failure. So jaundice, the right upper quadrant pain, and renal failure are going to be some key findings in acute and subacute bud carry syndrome. In chronic bud carry syndrome, it's going to be a very slow progression of signs and symptoms. And what's often going to be noted is that we're not going to see a lot of these right upper quadrant pain. We're not going to see jaundice. We may see some renal failure in some patients who have chronic bud carry syndrome, but we're 
often going to see very minor symptoms that slowly occur over time. And one of them that is going to occur more frequently is going to be ascites. And then in the fulminant form of Bud Carey syndrome, we're going to see ascites, we're going to see renal failure, we're going to see jaundice, and we're going to see hepatomegaly. So fulminant is going to be a very rapid, sudden onset of signs and symptoms, and it's going to lead to a very tender hepatomegaly. That's going to be key to a fulminant Bud Carey syndrome. So these are the various clinical types, and I also want to mention that some patients with Bud Carey syndrome may be asymptomatic. Up to 20% may have no symptoms at all, especially if it's a very slow, progressive, chronic type, and especially if only one hepatic vein is affected. Now let's talk about the diagnosis and workup of Bud Carey syndrome. So the diagnosis and workup is going to be broken down into imaging. So imaging to diagnose or to make the diagnosis of Bud Carey syndrome is going to include Doppler ultrasonography. So you can see in this image here, you can see the blockage of the hepatic vein. Hepatic venography can also be utilized and a magnetic resonance imaging can also be used to make the diagnosis as well. Paracentesis can also be utilized to help with the diagnosis. A lot of times we are going to see ascites, so paracentesis, so tapping to assess the acidic fluid is going to be helpful as well. With the acidic fluid in Bud Carey syndrome, the serum ascites albumin gradient is going to be less than 1.1 grams per deciliter or less than 11 grams per liter. Unless it is the acute or subacute form of this condition where if it is the acute or subacute form of Bud Carey syndrome, it may be greater than these numbers. So it may be greater than 1.1 or greater than 11 grams per liter. Oftentimes the acidic fluid is also going to have a high protein level greater than two grams per deciliter, but white blood cell count is going to be less than 500 per microliter in Bud Carey syndrome. So these are some of the findings of the acidic fluid in Bud Carey syndrome. And then some other workup that can also be employed includes blood work. So because there's going to be some damage to the liver and the liver cells, the hepatocytes, there can be elevated aminotransferase levels, so elevated AST and ALT. This is going to be found in up to 50% of patients. A liver biopsy can also be performed in some patients to make staging possible, especially in those that are requiring a liver transplant due to end-stage liver disease or liver damage from the Bud Carey syndrome. And because a lot of the cases of Bud Carey syndrome are due to hypercoagulable conditions or states, PT, PTT, and INR can also be measured as well. And this can be important for determining what might be causing Bud Carey in the first place. So a lot of the diagnostic methodologies, besides what we've just mentioned, can be utilized to find out the cause of Bud Carey syndrome. So looking for cancers, looking for particular hypercoagulable conditions, and others. So again, these are some of the diagnostic methods and workups for Bud Carey syndrome. Once clinicians have made the diagnosis of Bud Carey syndrome, how do they treat it? So it's important to note that there is a poor prognosis in patients with this condition if it is left untreated. Mortality can occur within three years if this condition is not treated. Some of the treatments can include the following. So medication, so anticoagulation can be utilized, especially once Bud Carey syndrome has been resolved and to prevent or reduce the risk of further clotting in the future, especially if a hypercoagulable condition has been identified. Thrombolytics can also be utilized to destroy the clot. So certain thrombolytics have also been noted to be particular medications that can be of use. Certain procedures can also be important. So radiologically guided procedures like local thrombolysis can be important for actually destroying the clot that is causing Bud Carey syndrome. Balloon angioplasty can also be employed as well. A TIPS procedure can also be employed in some patients. So a TIPS procedure is known as a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. And in some cases, a liver transplant would be required as well, especially if there's been prolonged or severe damage to the liver. So if there is liver cirrhosis. And then some other things that may be utilized include therapeutic paracentesis. So if the patient has been tried with diuretics or the ascites is causing issues or if the ascites is not being resolved, a therapeutic paracentesis may be utilized. So this is where it's not for diagnostic purposes or not to check the acidic fluid. It's just to drain the abdomen of fluid. So that would be considered a therapeutic paracentesis. 
Endoscopy for varices would be important. So for liver patients in general, it's important to check to see if they have esophageal varices because they're going to be important to identify for morbidity and mortality risk measurements. Non-selective beta blockers can also be utilized for patients who have esophageal varices. So either the esophageal varices can be banded or they can undergo sclerotherapy or they can be put on non-selective beta blockers for prevention of issues from the esophageal varices. For management of their ascites and peripheral edema, diuretics can be utilized. And low sodium diets can also be important for patients as this will also help with ascites and their peripheral edema. So if you want to learn more about other liver conditions, please check out my playlist on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you next time.